thanks, Pete. That saves me some work. I don't have to uh, introduce these two gentlemen. Um, the state of the union for the Bitcoin market. It's certainly been a landmark year for crypto and for Bitcoin in particular. And we have one of the earliest technologists in the space with us in Mike Belshi and one of the earliest investors in the space in Mike Novogratz. So I think we're going to get uh, some interesting perspective. Let's just kick things off. Um, Mike, right now we've, we've seen the price hover around and for, this, for the purpose of simplicity, I'll call Mike Belshi Mike and Mike Novogratz Novo. Um, <laughs> Mike, what is the state of Bitcoin right now? Everyone's focused on price, but how would you describe the state of Bitcoin aside from its ever gyrating price? Well, you know, for, for those of us that have been around in the space as long as you know, eight, eight years, uh, I think that things have never been brighter for Bitcoin, frankly. Um, it takes a lot to change the way money works in the world. And the visibility of Bitcoin today is stronger than it's ever been before. The number of users is stronger than it's ever been before. In order to get where we really want to go with the most interesting components of how you change finance, impact the most people's lives, you know, obviously the first thing you have to do is, is, is get through all these hurdles. So at, at Bitco, we've been you know, plumbing institutional infrastructure making it so that everybody can participate, making it so that you can make digital assets, Bitcoin, ubiquitous for all. And uh, it, it's been really strong. A lot of people look at the, the price. That is what lures a lot of people in. But frankly, the, the bigger opportunity is actually around making humans' lives better. And I, th I think the strength of Bitcoin has never been brighter. For those who do not know, these two firms recently announced a major acquisition deal Galaxy Digital is going to acquire Bitco for north of a billion dollars. I think if there's any news event that happened this year that indicates how much the space has grown, it's this um, acquisition deal. Mike, there's this backdrop. Novo, there's this <laughs> backdrop. I'm ready. Of new market participants entering the space in 2021. And even a bit in 2020, we saw firms allocating Bitcoin to their balance sheet. Describe to the audience the backdrop that allowed for folks to sort of rethink the way they thought about their portfolios and then move into Bitcoin. What changed? Was it COVID or was it an amalgamation of, of different things? Sure. Well, first, I want to say thanks for being here. Uh, first uh, time I've been on stage literally since pre-COVID. Uh, you can tell with my jackets, I kind of like to peacock a little bit. And uh, I'm just sick of doing Zoom calls. I've probably have done a thousand since then selling Bitcoin. Um, it's, a lot, it's a lot more fun to do it in, in person. Listen, you know, COVID really was seminal in some ways. Uh, when I was a helicopter pilot in Alabama, there was this town called Enterprise, Alabama. And they have a statue in the middle of the town. Uh, and it's, they're holding up a bug. And I'm like, why is this beautiful woman holding up a beetle? And it was a, mon a monument to the bow weevil because the bow weevil ate all the cotton plants and destroyed all the cotton crops. And so they had to plant peanuts and peanuts brought prosperity to the region. And I kind of thought in a really macabre way that the crypto community, the Bitcoin community should have a statue with that damn COVID virus uh, <laughs> because it in so many ways accelerated the adoption of what we're doing. Uh, Microsoft CEO talked about, you know, two months of, of advancement, in, uh, two years of advancement in two months in terms of the digitalization of everything, right? Zoom wasn't a thing and now it's a thing. And so the idea of digital, the idea of moving into the metaverse, wildly accelerated in all our consciousnesses. But more importantly, the monetary and fiscal response to COVID, both in the United States and in every country, gave a wild backdrop uh, a gigantic tailwind to the Bitcoin as a store of value argument, to Bitcoin as a hard asset. And so we started to see hedge funds. You know, first Paul Tudor Jones, who's one of my dear friends, you know, one of the legendary hedge fund managers, really, I, I, I'd put him at top four of all time, uh, came out and wrote a pretty detailed paper on why he was buying Bitcoin. That allowed every other hedge fund manager to buy it. And they might not be right and wrong on the price, but they're not going to get fired for looking like a fool. And then Stan Druckenmiller got in and the next hedge fund and the next hedge fund. We saw the same thing with insurance companies. 
right? Mass Mutual got in, New York Life got in, and then more and more. We're seeing the same thing with real money managers. And so this institutional adoption that I had been talking about for years and waiting, I felt like I was waiting for Godot, it just wasn't coming, all started showing up at once. And now we're seeing it in the wealth channels. We did a deal with Morgan Stanley recently uh, to sell Bitcoin through a fund. And what's unique about that is, you know, when I started selling Bitcoin, there was Dan Moorhead from Pantera and myself as kind of the two institutional guys knocking on doors and having them slammed in our face. Um, with Morgan Stanley alone, we trained 4,000 salesmen, right? Their FAs needed to take a course to understand Bitcoin to be able to sell it. So you think about how Bitcoin works, it's all about adoption, right? It's not the technology that gives it its value, right? We could, we could fork it and call it NovoCoin and it wouldn't be worth anything, right? It's the, it's the I think it'd be worth something. A little bit. A little bit. <laughs> but it's the social construct that makes it worth something, right? It's worth something because we think it's worth something. And so you need these processizers. And we just got 4,000 more with Morgan Stanley. And Goldman Sachs is coming. JP Morgan's coming. UBS is coming. Every major financial institution is now going to have a Bitcoin product. And so I've taken it as my mission to bring people into the tent. Not as smart as Bell Sheet. Don't <laughs> even really understand how Taproot works. Uh, or Schnorr, or any of the real technical pieces. But I understand the psychology of pulling people into the tent, and I just see that accelerating. I think that was a really good sum summary of the institutional adoption we've seen this year. Um, kind of centered around this idea of Bitcoin as a store of value, as a digital gold. But that narrative relative to the history of Bitcoin is fairly new, right? Belshi, when you got involved in the space, it seemed more so like a new revolutionary payment system, a way to exchange value, and now we've sort of moved to digital gold. Maybe we can talk about the narratives that have sort of surrounded the Bitcoin market, and where do you see that going into the future? Will it always be store of value, or will things like Taproot or Lightning um, bring us back to maybe some of those more OG narratives? Well, look, um, I think as the in industry and the community's gotten larger, we're able to start to see what is the, the, the shining star. And there's been countless debates about is it about payments and store value, et cetera. It's very clear that store value is where Bitcoin is really excelling. And what do you need for store value? You need a money that's dependable. You need to know it's not going to change. You need to know that you're going to be able to count on it 20 years from now, right? Um, and especially in the, the backdrop of coronavirus, where we're thinking about the macro world and how much you know, governments are, are losing control of their supply, right? That's happened in foreign nations for years, right? So those that have been through those types of crises with hyperinflation and things uh, know very well that you can have everything wiped out if you don't have good store value. So I, I think Bitcoin is, is clearly going to continue down that path. I think over time, more players will try to do other things, and some, at some point those things might take, take effect, but at least right now, uh, it's a store of value. That's what's getting people excited about it. That's what makes it global. Um, on payments, one last thing. If you, if you want to have a great payment system, you know, it, it can't be as volatile as, as Bitcoin. Who wants to pay with Bitcoin, right? Uh, it, it, it might be a use case for a digital asset at some point, but you're going to spend assets which aren't going up tremendously in value. And frankly, you know, you get paid in dollars. You get your taxes are required to be paid in dollars. So there's uh, th there's going to be a need for the U.S. dollars for that. And stable coins are emerging as, as a better way to handle payments. Bitcoin is a better way to handle store value. Yeah, I'd add one thing, which I think is really important. Uh, Bitcoin started as the first peer-to-peer -peer digital money and then morphed into store value. Talking to regulators, and we talked to a lot of them, it, the moment you start talking about Bitcoin as money, it's a giant target. They're just not going to put up with it. They allow store value, right? Regulators and, and politicians know that as fiat gets to base, people want to have a place to, to store value, right? You can store it in real estate, you can store it in art, you can store it in gold. Bitcoin is by far, in my mind, the best place to store value. In some countries, it really is like a human right, right? When, you're, when you think about places like Zimbabwe or Nigeria or Uzbekistan, when you've got depreciating currencies all the time. Uh, and so, it, certainly for the next chapter, uh, staying focused on that lane, that narrative uh, is going to keep Bitcoin outside of the, the crosshairs of the regulators. 
Like no country wants to give up their money. And so you say, oh, we're gonna have, we're gonna, we're gonna replace the dollar with Bitcoin and every politician, every central banker, every regular just says no, no, no. And so this lane of store value, and it's also what it serves best, right? Who wants to spend Bitcoin if we think it's gonna double in the next few years or triple or quadruple? I, I think of all the Bitcoin I gave away to charity at a thousand and all those charities sold it. And I'm like, yeah, you know, that would have been consequential for each of those charities uh, if they had held the Bitcoin. And so I learned my lesson uh, if I'm giving Bitcoin to ch charities to make them hold it. Some might look at the volatility and say that that's a reason why it maybe can't be a store of value though. It's more of a store of value than AMC stocks or whatever have you, Argentinian peso, but is a store of value something that can go from 62,000 or above 60,000 to 38? Look, look where we were at the beginning of the year, right? We were at 30,000, we're still up 33% on the year. Uh, the s and Do institutions up. buy that argument? Institutions are starting to buy the argument. I, I tell people all the time, Bitcoin is an 80 vol asset, right? Why people trade it with leverage is beyond me. Like that's really, it's like just mainlining it, right? Uh, <laughs> and so if you're an institution, right, you're not gonna put 50% of your portfolio into Bitcoin. We tell people start with two to 3%, right? Vol adjusted, if you think about it, S&Ps are 15 to 20 vol, right? So you're, you know, gold is eight vol, currencies are 10, six, six to 10 vol. But, you know, that's like a 15% position if you vol adjusted or a 20% position. And so institutions are getting that. We also tell them buy some and then buy the pullback to the 50 day moving average, right? You can scale in. This is a long term play for institutions. So hedge funds buy uh, to try to make money. They stop out, they rebuy, they trade it just like any other asset. But insurance companies buy it as a long duration asset instead of bonds. They're like, who wants a treasury bond at you know, 2% for 30 years? So they're putting Bitcoin as their long duration asset. Um, and so, Depending on the institution, they handle it differently, but most real, real money managers, insurance companies, high net worth families, they're buying it for the five year period, not for the five week period. Interesting. Belshi, I know market structure and the sort of underpinning, you know, infrastructure of this market is something that's important to you and, and definitely important to BitGo as a firm. Um, walk us through maybe some of the more relevant developments we've seen on the market structure side that's sort of going to set up the space for success over the next year. Prime brokerage is something that is often talked about. Right. Well, on the institutional side, you know, if you go into any other asset class, you find a mature and uh, uh, heavily built uh, industry with multiple participants. You've got, you know, different roles between brokers and exchanges and clearing houses and custodians and banks. And it's all kind of separated apart. It was built you know, at a time we didn't have the technology we have today. It was built at a time where you know, settlement had to be slow because there was no digital component of that. So now as crypto emerged, because we didn't have incumbents ready to participate there, we ended up with these very verticalized silos, right? So where all the exchanges had to take on every function, right? They are the broker, they're the exchange, they're the clearinghouse, they're the bank, they do all the roles. Um, on one hand, it's very lean and efficient, takes out middlemen, great. Uh, on the other hand, you know, if you're an institution looking to participate in digital assets, you look at that, you're like, wait a minute, I got full 100% counterparty risk on this one entity. That's a difficult place to be. So the industry has been moving, I think, quite successfully over the last three years. We hear this a lot from clients that they took a look at Bitcoin back in 2017 and they couldn't participate because it was all just single counterparty risk with relatively small companies. You know, you fast forward to where we are at today, we're seeing separation between exchanges and storage. We're starting to see some separation between exchanges and brokers to some degree. We've got much larger companies. Coinbase is, you know, public listing this year, elevates them to a different level. Mike already mentioned every single bank, every single financial institution on the planet has had a crypto team working for the last five years now, literally five years, right? This started a long time ago. And uh, so these things are getting teased apart in a way that institutions and investors can have confidence that they couldn't have just three years ago. So the narrative today, when you talk to the, uh, you know, the hedge funds and even you know, uh, pension funds and you know, um, pretty conservative wealth advisors, uh, they took a look three years ago. They couldn't participate. They can participate today. A lot more work to do in order to get this all 
clarified, you know, the regulatory components really understood, make sure the legal components are really strong, but this is all happening. It's really, really good time. So, so one way to think about this is up until about five months ago, Bitcoin wasn't an institutional asset class, and now it is. That's a big, 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 big change. And so what that means is, if you're an institutional investor, if you're not long, you're short. And so we have this world out there of people thinking, how do I get engaged? That, was, that didn't exist two years ago. And so in some ways, this is one of the easiest macro bets I've seen, right? The total market cap of crypto, about a trillion and a half dollars, Bitcoin a little shy of a trillion. Uh, that's like 30 basis points of global wealth, right? Global net worth is about $440 trillion. And so a tiny piece of the, the, to the pie. Uh, another way to think about it is if I took Apple and all the people that worked at Apple, right? It's a $2 trillion company and put them on one side of a football field. And then I put all the intelligent people working around the crypto, the Bitcoin ecosystem, from the entrepreneurs to the technologists, and we had a fight, we'd have applesauce, uh, <laughs> right? The amount of human capital in our space is increasing by the week. The, the, the level of talent that we can hire at Galaxy that we're seeing move into our competitors is increasing in a quantum. And so I'm like, we're 30 basis points of global net worth. I wouldn't be in this business. I wouldn't hire 400 people if I didn't think in two to three years, we were gonna be five to 10 times that. And so I actually don't even see my competitors as competitors. I see them as collaborators, right? We're, we're all in this revolution trying to pull people into the tent. Uh, we need competitors. We need more people in this space. Uh, that's how it grows. And so I couldn't be more optimistic, quite frankly. You know, people get upset that the price went from, you know, 60,000 to 40,000. Uh, at one point, you need to kind of brush that off and not miss the forest through the trees. The real story is this incredible uh, influx of talent into our space and an open-mindedness of investors that used to have a closed mind. And I think COVID probably was one of the things that opened up their minds to this store of value narrative. You mentioned earlier, you don't see Bitcoin becoming a global reserve currency, which is something I'm sure many people in the audience would like to see. So I think it could become a global reserve asset. I think within the next 24 months, a central bank or a sovereign wealth fund will buy Bitcoin as an asset. But I don't see people trading it as a currency. The, the central banks just don't want that. And governments have a lot of power. Uh, listen, if the United States really screws it up, if Janet Yellen and, and uh, Chairman Powell really cock it up and our currency starts looking like Venezuelans, yeah, all bets are off, of course. But A, we're a long, long way from that, right? We have decent stewardship. People aren't buying Bitcoin not because they think we're gonna go into a hyper devaluation. They're buying it because the probability that that could happen went from really little to a little bit more than little. And so it's a hedge versus this debasement of currencies. Most of that debasement happens slow, right? You don't notice it, right? The British pound sterling, you know how many pounds it now takes to buy a pound of sterling? <laughs> That's been about a 97% or 98% devaluation over the last 75 years. Uh, citizens don't notice that, they're okay with that. And, and so that's one reason you hold Bitcoin long term. But it's if we have a, a breakdown of confidence, they call it in economics the Minsky moment, right? When confidence breaks, the yield curve steepens, the dollar plunges. In that case, all bets would be off. I just we're a long way from that. Mm -hmm. And it's a self reinforcing process. The more people who believe Bitcoin's a store of value, the more um, that narrative is going to cement it, itself. It, it is about getting people into the tent. My niece once said, are you CEO of Bitcoin? And I laughed because I kind of wanted to be. And I was like, no, 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 there's, there's no CEO of Bitcoin. One of the wonderful things about this ecosystem is, you know, one day it's Michael Saylor and the next day it's Dan Moorhead. And the next day it's, you know, some guy in a village in Indonesia convincing his people that Bitcoin is this wonderful store of value. Uh, Bitcoin is owned by over 140, 150 million people. It is, the story is told in every village in every country in the world. It's the most distributed asset in history. Think about it. We have built, we collectively have built 
one of the great brands of the last 100 years in 12 years. There's never been a brand built this fast with this much um, distribution. Mm -hmm. And so the Bitcoin community should take a bow. Uh, I look at the, old, the OGs and you know, even Roger Ver, who people like to throw things at, I was like, dude, it wouldn't be here without those guys that were pioneers. And so I always tip my hats to the early guys. <laughs> Mike, when you hearken back on those early Hasleon days of the Bitcoin world. Did you expect it to get this big? Uh, clearly you did, that's why you got in, but like, it must be sort of jarring to look back on hindsight. You know, uh, we've seen this a couple of times with technology in the last, you know, 20, 30 years. Uh, I was at Netscape early, and uh, I remember driving down the highway and seeing the first URL on a billboard. And I was with some of the really early guys at, at Netscape, Rob McCool and uh, Mark Andreessen. And, and for them, it was completely phenomenal that this thing that they had worked on really as a college project, you know, this World Wide Web thing, was now on, on billboards. Um, did they expect it? Yeah, they did. Were they surprised to see it? Yeah, they were. So I think we're in the same phase here, which is you know people getting, are getting into this. They're seeing that you know what we have the opportunity to change the way the financial system works. Very few people are perfectly happy with the financial system today. Um, we are very much a, a a global people as opposed to the local peoples that we've had, and there's an opportunity to change. So it's uh, it's gratifying to see the ecosystem where it is today, um, because yeah, you know a few years ago everybody said. Bitcoin, huh? Okay, uh, maybe, I'm not sure. And then increasingly, of course, we're seeing uh, changed minds everywhere, and so it's very uh, validating. But in some ways, it seems like Bitcoin's just becoming intertwined with the financial system versus completely usurping it. Do of course it is. I yeah. mean, I don't think you'd want to usurp, right? Uh, you know, it's, but being embraced as, as a legitimate part of it is, is what it takes to get started. And the, the digital asset world, Bitcoin, has the ability to do much more, but it's got to take hold. You know, as Mike said, across uh, people in every community, every industry, et cetera, first, uh, the high volatility will go down as it gets bigger. It'll get safer as it gets bigger. We'll have more participants as it gets bigger. You don't want to have single counterparties that you're dealing with. So, of course, it has to adopt that way, but once it gets to a a larger and larger size, more interesting things can happen. That's actually where the, the most change the financial system will occur. Well, one thing I find interesting, you know, and specific to Bitcoin versus all the other cryptos is how do you value things? How do you, how do you dream the dream and figure out where things can go? Um, in Bitcoin, we have a pretty good yardstick, right? We know what the market cap of gold is. And so I remember at the beginning of the year, I thought 65,000 was my target. Uh, pretty darn close. And that was because it was going to be roughly 10% of gold, 12% of gold. And I thought that would be the next, the next leg of the journey. I was talking to Bill Miller, who might be the single best investor, and he's a huge Bitcoin fan that I know. And he's the largest owner of Amazon, whose last name isn't Bezos, personally. <laughs> I didn't know that. I was like, oh, Bill's a lot richer than I thought he was. Uh, and I talked to him about how he held it so long, and it was the same thing. He said, once Bitcoin gets to 10% of gold, you're gonna be telling people it's gonna go to 20. And then at 20, you're gonna see 40. And at 40, you're like, of course it's gonna be gold. And that's the process we're going through, right? If you think about where gold is, that puts Bitcoin at about 500,000 in three or four years. And we're tracking that. You know, in every analog to digital transformation, the digital always way surpasses the analog, right? At that point, we probably are thinking of other use cases of Bitcoin. You know, but at this point, for me, I look at it as a percent of gold, and it's not going to all happen overnight, right? These things take time. People that buy it at 10,000, at 50,000, they 5x their money. There is an impetus to pull the trigger, to, to ring the cash register. It is the human psyche that everyone, you know, sitting with the position, hodling as it is said, I used to say, you have to handcuff yourself to the chair. It is not normal for us to just hodl. Right? The normal instinct is, I gotta book some profits. And part of it is, you make a whole lot of money. You wanna buy a house, you wanna buy your girlfriend a diamond ring. Uh, you, you wanna send your kid to college. And so we have these natural shifts up where then people are gonna sell and take profit. We rebuild, we need a new narrative, we, we head up again. And I think that's the process. Listen, we have some headwinds this year, right? 
the biggest headwind I see, forgetting the, the environmental concerns that I'm sure will get addressed, uh, I saw Don Wilson back there, he's pretty damn good at it, um, is because everyone got jabbed, the economy's roaring back. And there's a decent chance the Fed is gonna flinch, that Powell is gonna taper early. And when rates start going up, the big narrative for why we were all on Bitcoin this year, right? Printing press forever is at least gonna be put on pause. And so, again, I don't think anyone should expect Bitcoin's gonna go straight to the moon, even though I have a Bitcoin go to the moon tattoo on my arm. Uh, <laughs> And I have a song, but I'm not going to sing it, I promise. I thought you were going <laughs> to sing it. Maybe on the last day. Uh, I need a few more cocktails. This is too early for singing. Um, but I do think, right, be prepared, right? Don't think that this is the one-way rocket ship. We're going to go in waves. But as long as we continue to see adoption, the future looks really sunny. So Novo touched on a, a big headwind which is this macro picture. We only have a few more seconds left. Uh, Mike, give us a, a tailwind to close things out. What, what's, what's a big tailwind that we haven't talked about that will help Bitcoin adoption, AKA please moon? Which, what are you seeing? Well, look, I mean, um, I, I actually think that in spite of the, the headwinds, I think it's pretty much all tailwinds. Um, it just depends on your, your time horizon. The, the short-term changes as we go through various struggles, of course we want to have a clean energy. Of course we want Bitcoin to be a strong participant in pushing that forward. And guess what? It's probably the only product out there that actually can help us evolve to better, cleaner energy. So um, we're going to take some hits sometimes where people are kind of getting concerned about this issue or that. A few years ago it was, are the institutions going to come at all? Guess what? They're coming. Then it was like the corporates. Are they going to come? Guess what? They're coming. So you've always got you know, new obstacles to, 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 to jump, but we are jumping them. Let's do it. Let's jump to the moon. Let's jump to the moon. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you.